Welcome to the Copilot Connection. We're here to share with you all the news, insights, and capabilities of the Microsoft Copilot ecosystem from across the entire Microsoft stack. I'm Zoe Wilson, and I'm an executive at Avenard in our modern work business, an MVP for M365, a regional director, and a Viva Explorer. And I'm Kevin McDonnell. I'm an MVP, a Viva Explorer, and the Copilot strategy and modern workplace AI leader, Avenard. I've finally been um, given the okay to share that as the full title. Uh, I would like to call out a big thank you to everyone who's kind of commented and liked uh, the, the sharing of that, uh, especially uh, Annette, uh, who commented that that is possibly the longest title she've ever heard. Uh, as I said there, that is why we have Copilot to help summarize these things as well. Yeah, so it's a, a huge congrats, Kevin. Uh, it's really good to have you in our global modern workplace team. Um, I do think at Avenard we really like long job titles. So I think my, mine's actually longer at the moment than it was before, although it's a little easier to remember. But um, yeah, you just need to find a, a short version that works. Yeah, I, I do need to put mine into my email signature so uh, I can remember it as well. That's That I think is the key. But uh, and, and I should thank you as well, which I did forget to do on the list. Uh, so this week's been a really big week for announcements in the Copilot space. Uh, we've got lots and lots of news for you uh, to get through today, and we're really excited to share some of these latest announcements with you and talk about what we think this means for the world of Copilots. Um, where do we want to start, Kevin? Well, I, th I think probably with a big announcement that. Are we allowed to say caught us slightly by surprise uh, on there? I think it's it's fair to say when that jumped out. So uh, the whole notion of bringing the full power of Copilot to more people and business. So lots of lovely things. But the the one certainly I hadn't heard any insight on this was the Copilot Pro uh, about bringing Copilot to more people on the personal and uh well, the personal side, really. I, I know some people have said business, but I think it's very focused on those personal licenses, bringing co bringing Copilot into some of those personal family subscribers for those who are kind of accessing Word, Excel, PowerPoint without the graph, without Teams on there. So kind of very cut down version. But I think more interestingly, it's bringing that latest GPT-4 Turbo. So a lot of people who've purchased... Um, what's it called, ChatGPT Plus from OpenAI. I, I'm hearing a lot of friends and colleagues who are going, well, actually, yeah, I've been paying for that. I'm going to move over to this Copilot Pro instead because it'll give everything I want, but within this and the latest models in there, which I think is a very interesting move. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, really interesting. And I, I flagged this to a few people internally as well because I already think for the last year we've had a bit of a problem, No, uh, not not just where we were, but I think everyone has had a problem with shadow AI because people have started using things like uh, uh, like ChatGPT and the artist formerly known as being in their personal life. Um, and a lot of companies have had to create policies around being able to Sorry. use those things. What? Sorry, Zoe, I, I've got to say, please stop calling the artist formerly known as Bin Chat Enterprise, because I keep calling that as well, and it's really bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, but if I just call it co-pilot in a conversation <laughs> about many other co-pilots, people don't know what we're yeah. talking about. So it's the it's the uh, it's the best way to actually make it really clear. But anyway, we've so we've we've got companies who've had to put policies in place to say. Um, you know, you can't use these public um, the, the, these public systems for anything that's got work information in it. Um, what I think we'll see happen now is people with those family subscriptions will start to add on that uh, co-pilot capability into the Office apps. And, yeah, they don't get it in Teams and they don't get that full kind of enterprise protection. But they won't care about that because they just want to be able to use it in their apps. So people will start using this in the personal subscriptions. Will we see people starting to use their personal subscriptions for work so that they can get stuff done more effectively? And will this create added pressure inside organizations where people who've started using this in their, their, their personal apps are coming to work and saying, I, you know, I'm using this. I want this for work as well. So I think it's a, a, a really interesting and, and quite a clever move. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely agree. And uh, I, I think one of the the interesting things with this will be very much um, 
around how people use it and where organizations haven't had a strategy around their AI and especially if they're blocking things such as the summarized page that you can get within the artist formerly known as Bing Chat Enterprise uh, and people will start using that at personal ones where it's in there and and I think the other one uh, the announcement along with that was the the Copilot GPT so ways to extend that Copilot Pro um, version with your using a Copilot GPT builder so people who want to do the extensions and I know we've had a lot of conversation people who, who want to be able to doing that in their own tenants but obviously there's, there's a limitation you can't just suddenly allow people to create a load of play examples in, in Copilot for Microsoft 365 so will they start using Copilot Pro bringing these GPT builders and make it happen with that so that's yeah, I, I agree. The shadow IT could be interesting. And let's hope that people just go, let's block everything. Let's stop everyone doing anything. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. I mean, I'm kind of a proper strategy in place. Yeah. So, so I haven't I haven't actually uh, looked at this yet because I'm, I'm debating at the moment whether I um, whether I add Copilot Pro onto my family subscription or whether I add it into my personal tenant that I've got. I, I, I'm not I, I, I might end up doing both because actually I'm really interested in a, from an end user perspective what you know what do these fitness travel cooking GPTs look and feel and smell like um my other half he he uses chat GPT to refresh his training programs so he asks he gives it the parameters and he asks chat GPT to give him his weightlifting programs so um you know I'd be really interested to kind of see what that experience is like in that Copilot mm -hmm. pro subscription. I would say that's quite a lot of money there, sorry. And one one thing with that Copilot Pro, you do need that family um subscription as well, that personal family. So there is additional cost on there. And and we, if you're getting all those different ones, that is enough to afford another cat. You know, just just want to put that <laughs> out there and think about it. Yeah. As well. Uh, I think you're underestimating how much our cats uh, cost us in ongoing costs. <laughs> um, True. But True. but but yeah, I mean, so I so I've got the family subscription because um, it's easier than giving my parents licenses in my my own tenant. Uh, just from a general management and, and maintenance perspective. But for people who don't have it, I, I I've already seen examples of people thinking that they can go and get Copilot Pro for uh, twenty dollars per user per month, or well. 19 pounds i think it is in the uk isn't it but you I actually think, yeah, need that yeah. you need that subscription first to be able to get that yeah so it, it is worth making sure people realize that because i know if you have gone oh yeah 20 pounds or 19 pounds that's great there's a little bit more than that which is okay um and just while i'm here a couple of other bits obviously there's the copilot mobile app that we talked about in the um in the last episode, then and that brings in that Copilot Pro, but also the fact that Copilot's coming to the the Microsoft 365 mobile app, and, and uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name. I think it's Ashley, the CPA, who's on Twitter, was talking about how she had a town hall uh, coming up, and she just got her Copilot for Microsoft 365 license uh, on there, and I was like, great, use it on mobile. It's a really good way of getting into that as well, and and the fact you can do it with that M365 app uh, adds even more than just Teams as well. Talking of Copilot for Microsoft 365 licenses, there was a, an interesting announcement in here about that as well. Yeah, and I think this is the one that's actually generated the most noise on every social media platform going this week. Um, so Microsoft have lifted the minimum requirement for 300 seats, uh, which I know has been a cause of enormous frustration for smaller organizations and actually not even smaller organizations, just, just organizations who yeah, didn't want to spend sure. as much money as 300 licenses cost. Um, so that 300 seat limit is gone. Um, M365, E3 and E5 is no longer the full prerequisite. Uh, people can now add this on to Office 365, which is really interesting. Um, you can buy licenses through CSP and WebDirect. So it's not only enterprise agreement customers who can buy this anymore. Um, and and this, just, I think, is um, sorry, sorry. Just so you mentioned CSPs on there. Just for those who don't live within that license world, the web direct is you go into the admin settings, you can kind of click, throw in your credit card, you can purchase things there. CSP is through a cloud solution provider. It's another company that you provides you with the licenses and makes it easier for you to to manage that for for organisations as well. So two two ways you can go and purchase that. 
Yeah, uh, that's a really, really good call out as well, just, just to make sure that everyone gets that. Um, and then last month, Microsoft announced that Copilot was available for education. It's also available for small businesses. So those organizations using our business premium and, and business standard can now buy between one and 299 seats. So this has really opened the floodgates for Copilot for Microsoft 365 in, a, in an enterprise and business setting. As you've probably mm. been able to tell from uh, social media, with everybody getting started with uh, with Copilot, and there's been such a huge amount of enthusiasm and energy and kind of uh, early person guidance. Yeah, I, I think it, it, if you're looking on LinkedIn at the moment, it's not about the the sessionized top three percent of speakers. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, or or for the or here's how you get going with Copilot. It is obviously the thing on there and. I, I, and I, I genuinely don't want to downplay. Uh, yeah, I, I think many of us are finding it irritating because there's so much there, but there is some really good content. So we, we've tried to pick up uh, a couple of things that are really important from there. Again, not to downplay any of the other ones that have been put out there. There's some really nice ones. Uh, UC Royne put a, a good kind of single summary that covered all, all a lot of it. I might try and uh, grab that and put that in the show notes. Um, as well but I, I think one that jumped up to me was again going back to the official microsoft documentation and it's worth saying there's a lot of great stuff out there but there's a lot of stuff out there so finding where to get started can can be a bit of a challenge with that and i've heard a lot of people kind of uh, a fellow mvp kind of said you know what do i need to do well i'll be honest you need to buy your license um, there's a bit of readiness in terms of uh, turning things on. So you've got your apps for enterprise, there's enabling loop um, within there. Um, you probably should be looking at information protection. This this guide is a great one that, that talks about what you need to turn on. You buy your licenses, you assign that to people, and you tell them. That really is, from a technical perspective, pretty much it. Uh, and I love that for Copilot. What what is worse is obviously you then also need to think about your adoption, making sure people are using it, guiding through how um, on there the adoption.microsoft.com site is great for that. I know a lot of people go, yeah, that tells me how to roll it out. But what do I need to do? You need to assign the licenses. That's it, really. I think yeah. So so uh, the, the, <laughs> there's part of me that's sitting here thinking, yeah, that's kind of what you need to do to, to do to get the licenses out, but. Um, I think what, one of the things that we see is, uh, you know, a, a lot of organizations are now kind of looking at what they actually need to do to go through kind of data privacy assessments, risk assessments. Um, the, the, those are things that you, you need to do as you start to plan for scale. I think, um, you know, all of those security and compliance considerations. But if you just want to start deploying your first licenses in your organization, it's really easy to do that now. Um, now, one of the things we did want to talk about was this 300 seat limit. Um, we we've, we heard a few kind of uh, rumors or comments that um, there was a, there was an understanding or a misconception that this 300 seat minimum requirement was in place because that is what was needed to train the model, and <clears throat> we we just wanted to talk about this a little bit because um, to me that demonstrates a really clear misunderstanding of how Copilot works and how the semantic index works. Because Copilot isn't trained on your users or your data, um, that that's that just that doesn't happen at all. You know, when when you get Copilot in your organization, there's a semantic index that runs at tenant level, and that creates this vector map of all of the the content and relationships and phrases and and things like that at tenant and content level. And then when the users get Copilot. So even if you've got 300 licenses, you can give just one to one person and that there's a semantic index that runs at user, user level, which builds that kind of vector map based on the user and who they work with and their chats and their emails and their calendar and that kind of thing. So the 300 seat limit was never about training. It wasn't about, you know, it's not a hard technical requirement. Um, and I don't think we've ever had kind of a clear answer as to why we had a 300 C limit. But, you know, based on the the, um, the the work I've done over the last few months, kind of my take on this is if you think about the if you think about what Microsoft did in July last year, they started this early access program. And um, that was essentially a 
pay to play private preview. So you had lots of big enterprise organizations who were paying to take part. And for the organizations, for them, it was about understanding what Copilot for M365 could mean to their business and um, you know what, what that first mover advantage could look like if they got off the starting blocks quickly. For Microsoft, what they needed was enough people. They needed enough critical mass to be able to test the products and get feedback into the product group so they could iterate and get this ready to release as soon as possible so that they could get their own market advantage. So, um, you know, 300 users is a, a meaningful enough number to allow Microsoft to get the insight that they need, to allow the enterprise organizations to get the learning that they need about what, what the art of the possible is with Copilot and what it could mean for their business. And then when Microsoft announced that this was generally available in uh, the, the late autumn, early winter, if they'd have, at that point, if they'd have said, it's generally available and you can have one license, all of those organizations who paid to be in the early access program would have gone absolutely mental. They, they would not have, um, you know, they would not have been happy at all because for them, they've they've kind of elected to take part in this early private preview and then suddenly anybody can have it and they don't need to have 300, they can go for less. So for me, it's much, it's much more that kind of political nuance, commercial advantage, the, the amount needed for testing. And, and I think also it's that support that they needed to give people initially, even beyond the EAP, there was still a lot of manual processes they need to go through so it, it wasn't just upsetting those big clients I, I think that played a big part in it but it was kind of understanding if they suddenly turned it on for everyone there was a hardware capacity there was a people capacity there was all these bits that fed into it and if you if something went wrong and you had all these different clients kind of completely so it, i think a, a combination of those those things but it, this isn't viva topics we're, we're talking about here where you kind of need a certain amount of capacity a certain amount of usage that isn't the case uh, and I, I, I think a great example there's the tap program uh, where you can uh, request a sandbox for developing extensions that's got 10 licenses works very well because you can develop all your extensions and do things on there that's a demonstration of that and I think we've seen other smaller ones start to crop up we're hearing people who are just turning it on with one license and it works so uh yeah i, I think yeah yeah as and I, I, yeah you brought up some great points there around kind of the uh you know the actual technical capacity and and those kinds of gating requirements as well so um when you when we think about what this is as an opportunity for microsoft it's a really important market opportunity um and you, you can see this by the fact that um they actually overtook apple as the biggest company with you know the biggest market cap um so it was but really important for a time, for a time yeah yeah badly, but yeah still, still yeah but you know it so it was it was really it really important so that 300 limit it's nothing to do with training it was more about microsoft making sure that they handled this right and i know some smaller organizations feel like it was handled terribly because they couldn't get access to it but you can now i i think for me, I, I disagree with that. I don't think it's it's that they couldn't access. I think the way it was done was not ideal. The, the kind of communication mm. is like, we're going generally available, but you can't have it. Um, probably. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I can understand that. So uh, I, I think if they, they could have managed that a little bit nicer and more. Delicate, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the other biggest thing... company in the world, they don't need to. Yeah. So the other thing just on this 300 seat limit as well, before we get on to some of the rest of the news, um, is what does this mean then for people who are getting co-pilot now? Is it just is it OK for them to just get one license or what? You know, what is the kind of number that they should look to get? And we do. You know, we know I, I was going to ask you that question, but I thought, no, that's cruel. Don't do that. That's not fair. Yeah, so so I I you know I um, I know people who have, have basically got one co-pilot license in their organisation because they want to be able to test it and understand it. Um, typically, these people work in IT, so they're understanding it from an IT perspective. But actually, yeah. from an enterprise perspective, which is an important side, you know, there are things you need to consider as well. Yeah, yeah but from an from <laughs> from from an enterprise perspective, though, you can't you can't run a pilot and understand the value to an organization and what it means across your business with one with one license so um i still think that there needs to be a, a reasonable sized 
pool of licenses that are distributed across an organization and the, the the exact number will be different depending on the size and scale and shape of the the organization but it needs to be meaningful enough so that actually when you start to think about a business case and ROI and who gets it and what it looks like there's enough to actually base that decision on and and I think also also come back to small businesses you need enough people to be able to try it out together as well so uh, I, I absolutely agree with you for enterprises I think scaling that down to small business you need more than one you need people to be able to work together one on it as well otherwise it doesn't work and I would say with those large enterprises as well bringing groups of people together who can who can work on it too um okay I just want to bring up so it kind of jumped ahead and, and you were talking earlier about what you need to do i talked about the technical side to turn on absolutely agree similar uh, simple thing there but there's more to it uh, and i love this that martina groms put together of a uh, a co-pilot collection it's a collection of learning paths of the things you need to do and it's got the links to things like preparing your organization looking at data and security and compliance uh, introducing what it is uh, looking in there, it's got the admin roles you need to prepare for handling sensitive data. I know that's a fun conversation. I was chatting with someone uh, at a small small organization who's got some licenses, but they can't turn them on because their uh, security and legal people are saying, no, we don't know what data's there. So considering that and making sure you, you go in with an informed decision on there. Um, I'd probably say to Martina, it'd be good to have some of the adoption um, elements that I think are included within that preparing your organization for Copilot as well uh, within there. But there's a good thing going beyond the simply turning it on exactly as you were talking about earlier, Zoe, the, the extra pieces around there. Yeah, uh, and that, that's that's one of the things that we, we've seen. You know, this this isn't just a turn it on and let people have at, have at it technology. You, you really need to put that thought into how how people will build that co-pilot muscle yeah yeah absolutely um for those on the techier side who kind of want to understand how it works we'll put this link in there was a great session at ignite um that i think i touched on previously uh within there but kind of re-watched it after a conversation with someone because they wanted to say well hang on co-pilot looks at your data and gives you information about that but i could now do that with ai studio there's various azure things copilot studio i could put in load of sharepoint sites what is the extra that copilot from microsoft 365 gives you and i think this talks about all the extra effort that microsoft have done that yeah you can go and do yourself but there's a lot of effort to get towards that especially in the breadth plus the embedding it into your flow of work as well. So if people are asking that question, I love this video to give you some um, kind of pointers towards that as well. Great shout out, Kevin. Uh, and then another one you share with me, Zoe, there's a lot in this document uh, as well. I'm jumping to the HTML version, but the, the U UK has just published their generative AI framework. So this is stretched out a little bit from Copilot. It does talk about Bing. It talks about um, Copilots or certainly the, the Microsoft Copilots plus Copilot Bing as well. But it's talking about understanding that, uh, what you need to think about building generative AI solutions, the uh, safety and responsibility. and. I don't think it's unfair to say that quite often I see these government articles and I wince slightly and go, oh, this is going to be horrendous. They're going to have missed the point completely. I, I haven't gone into this in full detail, but my look through of it, I um, really like the coverage on here. They're certainly hitting the right topics and the, the, the commentary in it is, is very nice. So if you're looking to something to kind of think about how, how do you set out your own uh, framework, uh, you know, we talked earlier about making sure you have an AI strategy, really nice to take a look at this one as well. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's really good to actually see the to see them publishing this and making it available because there's so much demand across across the public sector as well as in private sector and and, and non profit. So I think I think this will really help, uh, and I expect we'll see other countries doing the same if they haven't already. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear if anyone's in other countries have seen similar that have been published. Uh, and, you. Know, you uh, Kind of setting out frameworks that aren't necessarily the nicest and are more blocking things so maybe if there's some positive ones out there that people have seen would love to see those as well 
uh, should we move on to some more news as well as just kind of he's co-pilot he's what you need to do yep of course now obviously we are the co-pilot connection we cover all the different co-pilots um within there and it was really exciting to see this one uh around fabric so you should now be able to enable co-pilot in fabric and in power bi um within that uh this came out was it yesterday oh no it was three days ago my goodness time's going by quickly um uh, around this so i think there is a blog post i couldn't find it earlier but i will try and add it to the show notes if i could bring up there but it's there is a a, a link i'll put in the show notes around uh, an overview of what copilot and fa fabric and power bi is uh on there the capabilities it talks about how you can enable it so it's not turned on by default but if you have your your power bi licenses then you can go in and um start to turn that on in different areas so well worth a look about that power sorry power bi premium i should say specifically before people get excited and they go oh i haven't got that um it's got those capabilities and i will be honest i'm really excited i had a, a chat with a, a colleague today around some of the the things that this can do but you think being able to interrogate your data through chats with that uh there's lots of really interesting things coming uh around that as well so well worth a look at that one yeah i think one of the things i'm really excited about as well kevin is uh you know as, as we start to see the co-pilots maturing and rolling out in the different products um it, it's the point where they mature enough to actually kind of integrate more easily and start working together I, you know i think it's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting year or two. Yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, and I, I think we'll see more co-pilots coming. Talking of which, uh, Mr. Jack Robotham, um, who is doing a fantastic one. If you're not following him on LinkedIn, do because uh, he's really on the pulse of so much happening, not just in the co-pilot, but in the power platform world and around co-pilot studio and others. It's really uh, sharing some great stuff. And he noted that uh, co-pilot and customer insights is now available. So this is part of the Dynamics 365. Um, it, it really is about getting insights into your customer it does exactly what it says on the tin there um but with this you know as it says there you can generate ideas you can start to help build your materials um where we were talking about that capabilities in fabric about querying that it's the same with this customer insight so understand your data where you're pulling all that information uh you know, similar to what you'd have in um google analytics and different conversations you're having across those different channels being able to build those out i, I love this um looking at it, creating those customer segments I, I know zoe when you you and i and al did that session at the south coast summit and we showed a uh, whiteboard and that ability to have all those notes and then kind of group those together imagine being able to do that with customer segments instead of having all those internal debates and going round and round in circles i i love that idea of being able to kind of build that out based on the the data you've got that that could be really interesting um yeah re uh, really powerful I, I was talking to someone the other day actually who um is i think they use salesforce at the moment and they're really happy with salesforce um, but they're planning to move or they're considering moving to uh, Dynamics because they want to be able to take advantage of stuff like this and what they see as that end-to-end -end, wow. uh, integration and um, yeah, just that whole end-to-end -end ecosystem. Uh, and and when, you, when you look at things like that, you can start to see why. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So... Uh... I, I, one of the things I'd love to delve into a bit more is to to look at Einstein and some of the, um, the Salesforce. I know they they do generative AI. Maybe maybe that's something we can explore in a kind of slight offshoot to Copilot, looking at looking at the uh, the alternatives and and what they bring and don't. But uh, that's a really interesting story. Hmm. Talking um, of interesting, I was going to say it to the word out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> go on then, over to you. Um. So I've, I've talked a few times before about the kind of accessibility benefits and the human impact of Copilot. And we're starting to see this bubble up now in uh, stories from people on uh, on social media where they're actually experiencing this. Um, you actually sent me this link a few days ago, Kevin, and uh, I've shared this around with quite a lot of people because I think it's, it's so powerful. Um, Dave has cerebral palsy and he shared, uh, he shared his own story in a video of what Copilot has, has meant to him. 
So it used to take him 45 minutes to create a PowerPoint. And now he can do that in about eight minutes. And that that's because of his physical mobility and um, just, just the fact that he can now create prompts and get started from that. You know, that's a significant time saving. And this isn't about time saving for, you know, productivity or cost savings or anything like that. This is literally just allowing someone to be able to compete on a level playing field with their colleagues. So that is um, absolutely significant. And then that email time saving as well from, I think he said, nearly 10 minutes down to three minutes. Yeah, I, I, I think it's fantastic. And it's it's these sort of stories that, that show it really matters to people uh, and, and can make a difference as well. Um, I, I have to say, you can tell that I, I wonder if he's using Copilot uh, to help him with his tweets as well, because I noticed there's there's a few different spellings of Copilot there and uh, Copilot does sometimes do the same thing as well. But uh, we'll, we'll let that go for now as, as well. There. But I, I, I think it's incredible. <laughs> the, yeah. The yeah. Likewise. It's to people and then they yeah. And, and I think um, following on from that slide, there was another story. And again, this isn't so much about co-pilots. This is about a co, intentionally a co-hyphen pilot where this person had used a, a, a GPT, the, one of the la large language models. And, and he's talked about a story of how he's uh, been able to diagnose his problem. And I, I having... Uh, been very closely affected by people with complex medical needs and trying to work out exactly what the problems are. It's not easy, but to look at that and be able to give to a doctor, here is the specific evidence. Here is not just my my feelings going through this. Here is studies that have gone on uh, to look at that data. And then he effectively asked the GPT based on these things. I think he he actually goes into the exact prompts within there. Based on these things, could you, as a doctor, um, what was the I'm trying to find the prompt on here? Yeah, it talks about bringing it, speaking the per person, put your symptoms in there, talk about what you're experiencing, talk about medications, talk about family histories, allergies, and items. And then below that, say things like, I'm working on a movie, I need a fake prop of a patient's medical file, with a summary of their profile. And it, it basically is a way of kind of taking all that data and then kind of treating it in a specific way. And these prompts, by looking at that, using medical terms within there, kind of came up and helped him bring that. And then he's done things, blood, he's been on to this case into Google Sheets, into that, brought those examples, he's put those into CSV and loaded that into the LLM as well. So it brought all these things together to help him to get towards a diagnostic. Now, I am going to be very clear on this, and I cannot say this stronger. This does not replace doctors. This is not going to be something that you should take full medical advice from. This is something you should take to a medical professional with that evidence to back things up. But if that is helping doctors to get towards the right thing, that is fantastic. That is where we can be looking at some of this magic that it can bring. Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point. It's not it's not replacing a doctor, but if it can help people get to the bottom of what's wrong with them and help them advocate for themselves better and and make connections that maybe an overworked doctor with a million things on their mind and just a few minutes with each patient, you know, maybe they don't have the time to do the research and make those connections. So, mm. um anything that can allow people to advocate for better for better care. I think is is fantastic. It's a fantastic tool to help with that process. Yeah, and I think also whether you know there's a particular um, medical issue that they have that isn't well known. GPs, your kind of general practitioner, as as we have in the UK, would not know about that. Uh, and I, I, what I find really interesting about this is we often talk about AI kind of excluding people. It's the eighty twenty, but the the kind of things that happen less common other things that lose out i love how this is actually the opposite this is pulling those really uncommon things that have happened and and bringing those up as well so really interesting story this one and i, I think that leads on a little bit to to talking about accessibility and and the co-pilot um and oh i've clicked on the wrong link there we go um i think 
Copilot is obviously sorry. Copilots are obviously a hot topic with Microsoft uh, at the moment. We've just talked about those fantastic things that you can do with Copilot for Microsoft 365, those large language models. Um, the Ability Summit is taking place on March the seventh. Um, it's an online event within there. I see Jenny Lay Flurry. Um, is the accessibility lead at Microsoft and also certainly works on accessibility at Microsoft pushes there. Um, I love these events They're, you know, you get so much inspiration from this and understanding from there. So I, I highly yeah. recommend people to sign up for that. And there'll be just, so, news, which is why we're talking. Yeah, about yeah. Just, just, just to be clear, Jenny Leaflow is not just the accessibility lead. She is the chief accessibility officer. So, um, yeah, she she's fantastic. Um, I, I saw her. At, um, I think it was Future Decoded a few years ago. Uh, deliver mm. one of the keynotes. She, she spoke after Satya, yeah. and if she didn't say she was deaf, I wouldn't have known. Mm. So just, I, th I think that'd be a great event. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think we've got one I thing just, to share. Uh, just very quickly, sorry, because I think you're actually talking about accessibility and co-pilot at Collab Summit, um, if that's right, as well, is it? Yeah, so actually Teams Nation, uh, which is first. Teams so Teams Nation, yeah, Teams Nation in February. Um, so so I, I'm passionate about accessibility as well, and I, um, I've got a session that I've done for a few years now on accessibility in Microsoft 365, which is really a whistle stop tour of all of the hidden features that were developed for accessibility reasons, which a lot of people don't even know about. Um, and based on a lot of the findings about Copilot, uh, this is basically an updated version of that. So there'll still be a little bit of some of the normal accessibility features, but then really focusing on how Copilot helps amplify that. So that's that's in uh, February and then uh, um, the European Collab Summit in May. I'm also doing one on the human impact of Copilot, which will be a little bit around accessibility, a little bit around the value and benefits of Copilot. And, and that human impact, that's not being stressed of having to deal with so many uh, Copilot option uh, opportunities going on. That That's the impact, the positive impact, right? <laughs> yeah so for most people hopefully copilot has a positive impact i think i think for me and, and maybe you now as well kevin uh copilot has um has had a, a significant impact on my work-life balance for the past few months absolutely um moving away from work uh accenture had uh, a nice set of tech trends uh within there i don't know so if you want to talk at all about that but they, they were talking about their was it the four four areas particularly of that's going to be big this year yeah so so every every year accenture published their technology vision and the the one for 2024 came out just a few days ago as i'm sure everybody would expect it includes a a healthy amount of ai in there a lot of focus around generative ai chatbots ai agent ecosystems um, one of the things that I really like in this is that they say with generative AI, a digital butler is finally on the cards. That will make Donna Sarka very happy. I know that's that's what she had her ask, didn't she, in one of the previous shows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but this this is this is a really good a, a really good read. I think um, you know Accenture have their finger on the pulse of of what's happening in that technology space. Um, so, so definitely worth a read. Yeah, I, what I also liked in here is they were also talking about um, sort of space, the spatial computing as well. I know this isn't necessarily co-pilot, but I, again, and I've had this conversation possibly around Viva, uh, that these kind of trends that people get very excited about and then people feel they get dropped like a hot brick. Um, I, I think that spatial thing, lens but that's metaverse view of things is still around uh it's still there it hasn't disappeared and will continue moving along so i think that's uh it, it's good to see that's still included there as well yeah absolutely um one of the other things they talk about which i like as well is that kind of human machine interface where the um the challenge of technology not understanding us and our intent um, that's that's starting to get smaller. Mm. So machines are are getting better at interacting with us on on our level, which is really powerful. Um, Accenture did actually publish a, a book called Human Plus Machine, I think in 2018. Um, it only came on my radar last year when kind of the, the whole world went went Gen AI mad. 
Um, and obviously the the technology in that is a little outdated because it's from five or six years ago now. But for, for anybody that's kind of interested in this co-pilot and Gen AI space, I'd definitely recommend it. Um, some There's some really good sections around what they call the missing middle, which is the, um, the, the new skills and new roles that will need to be developed to... Um, to, to basically manage that interface between human and machine. So de definitely worth a read or a listen. I was gonna say, I know it's on my uh, audible backlog uh, of things to catch up. I need to do some more travel to catch up a few on those. Brilliant. Well, that was another really great discussion. Yeah, I, I was good. Now, I, I, yeah, I, we should, probably should jump in here quickly and say, Hang on, Kevin, you've said for the last three episodes we're going to have something about extensibility. It is coming, and we were planning to, and then Microsoft dropped the Copilot Pro and 300 user one, and we thought it would have been very silly not to uh, talk about that. So I promise it is coming uh, on there. I haven't ignored it. Uh, it is It is going to be there, I promise. Mm. And we've got lots lots more lined up. I think, Zoe, you're over in Seattle next week and, and might be. So if anyone's in Seattle and, and um, has got some interesting topics on Copilot, well, actually, you probably haven't got any time to speak to them, but maybe drop your line and, and see what can happen. Yes. I mean, so, so I'm, at, I'm in Seattle for a work trip, but um, there are a few people that will be around at the same time that I'm hoping I can catch up with. And, you know, even if I can just get their views on Copilot for five minutes, I'll be trying to pin them down. Um, but if anyone else is around, uh, definitely let me know. Um, we'd love to know what you all think of the latest news. Um, have you bought Copilot Pro? Have you added a license for Copilot to your own tenant if you have one or to your, your work tenant? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to hear about in this whole crazy world of uh, of co-pilots? Just, just drop us a line. Yeah, absolutely. And please, 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 please subscribe to us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Stroke X, subscribe to the podcast, follow us on YouTube, tell your colleagues, tell your clients, tell your friends on there. I did actually have a client say, ah, yeah, you're on the podcast, which was uh, people about that well so please tell people about this we want to be able to spread the word as well brilliant so thanks very much kevin thanks everyone for listening and we look forward to talking more soon thanks very much bye bye